my name is Renee Raffetto. I am the hospital preparedness coordinator um, in emergency preparedness for our local jurisdiction. Um, I have been in emergency preparedness for roughly 15 years, and I also have a two-year-old daughter who has cerebral palsy. <clears throat> in general, we've seen that there are a lot of disparities during emergencies and natural disasters for those people with um, access and functional needs. Um, anything from a, equi equipment, for example, um, I was a part of an evacuation where we had um, folks that were on ventilators, folks that were um, non-mobile, and um, folks that just had to have um, certain requirements um, that would keep them alive to basically get them to where they could go to be in a facility that was safe in 2018. There was a really bad fire here in California and, and we got a strike team of ambulances together and that was great. We had a great coalition response. A lot of people were helping. Unfortunately, um, a lot of the, the ambulances were basic life support. They didn't have the equipment that they needed to get folks from point A to point B on a ventilator right. or partners brought buses to help evacuate. Um, there wasn't an, a way to get folks who had a wheelchair on board these buses. Um, so there's a, a great impact and that's that's the bare minimum just of getting people from point A to point B. That's not including where they end up going. Mm -hmm. As a mom of a little one who who is um, dealing with mobility issues herself, um, she, she can't walk, she can't stand on her own. So if there's an emergency at our house, we have to think about what's gonna happen for her what do we need to have in the car? Does she need to have a walker? Does she need to have her stander? What does that look like? This is just general basic life. What occurs um, is that these are disparities that happen everywhere. And it's not based on uh, a, a disaster. It's not what is causing a disparity. The, the disaster is not causing it. It's just amplifying the issues that um, we're not doing the very best that we can to get folks what they need. A lot of these gaps have been identified um, in a response during an emergency. In a, in a lot of ways, we've made great strides, but this is one area that, that tends to um, get left behind in the planning portion. Well, my name is uh, Claire Dirksen. I am 32 years old. I work for the state of California and um, I've had hearing loss my entire life. I um, was born with uh, bilateral hearing loss. So both ears, I wear um, hearing aids. So some of the everyday challenges I face, uh, it's just simple as communication um, with people, whether it's uh, through the computer um, for work or in everyday life at a restaurant or in a, with a bunch of people at a social gathering. If, if you're looking at me and you see me, you don't see that, that I have hearing loss. Um, the thing about people with hard of hearing, we kind of live, we're, we're visible to everyone else as just normal people. And, but it's just kind of an invisible, um, uh, disability um and a lot of people don't take us seriously um because we can fit in with everyday life but it's it's hard for us most challenges with uh accessibility is um uh captions are a big thing um captions are not always accurate uh they don't capture all of the information um and i'm uh and then in everyday life I have to rely on lip reading and uh, that can be challenging depends on how slow or fast people speak my for my doctor I have to um, schedule hearing appointments and I have to call call the hearing aid center um, 
for all the other appointments I have to make. I know, wrote all that some fun stuff that can be do that can be done online. I don't do well on the phone talking to people because I know I can't uh, grasp all the information that people are telling me. Um, and so, <laughs> what happened there? I had ended up waiting three years to make an appointment or a hearing test, and um, and then got notified that I uh, am now a candidate for a cochlear implant. That my hearing has gotten drastically worse over the years. So for actually going to appointments. Um, for uh, doctor appointments, I'm able to do a lot of that online, except for the hearing aid center. And, um, you know, so simply waiting for my name to be called. I always wait five to seven seconds because I can't hear my own name um, <laughs> to make sure they, they called my name. Um, but in updating information from the doctor, some doctors don't understand that I have hearing loss or don't know. Um, and then they don't know how to talk to me. Um, and so I'm not able to gain accurate information, especially when I go to appointments alone. So some challenges and barriers that the deaf and hard of hear hearing community face during disaster um, can be what you would think, um, receiving important information um, especially on the news, the live captions are not live. So, um, it's not accurate information. And so, uh, the hard of hearing or deaf uh, community can miss a lot of that. Um, for evacuation alerts, a lot of people can't hear that. Um, I, I personally can't hear sirens, um, and, um, high frequency, uh, noises I cannot hear. Um, so alerts that are high frequency, like fire alarms, for instance, um, I cannot hear that. Um, and, and then you get, and then the info for power outages. Um, uh, if it's through the emergency radio, I won't be able to understand because it's all through the radio. And especially if your phone is, is out of battery or, my hearing aids are out of the batteries and I don't have any more. Uh, when the pandemic hit, um, was, uh, there, were, there were a lot of challenges that I, I certainly faced. Um, one, of, one of the biggest ones was um, people wearing masks and um, not a lot of people wore clear masks. So uh, I could not understand a lot of people. It seemed like everyone was mumbling because everybody had a cloth over their face um, and so my lip reading skills definitely declined um, and now I'm trying to get them back up to where they were before the pandemic um, yeah for the news um, I wasn't getting the right captions um, and for um, calling uh, for uh, getting info about if you were exposed and those were phone calls i would not be able to accurately get that information because it was over the phone and i didn't um i didn't have that live tra transcript scene that i do on uh, my current phone my name is joe fanzi i'm a physical therapist for Sutter care at home and i work with home health patients most of my patients are homebound are they required to be homebound? So a lot of them are uh, coming out of the hospital after acute conditions or acute admissions uh, to address medical problems. Uh, so some of them have had strokes, head injuries, broken bones. Some of them are severely compromised after staying in the ICU or in acute care for uh, days or weeks. So um, a lot of them are pretty weak. We go over a disaster preparedness plan with all of our patients. It's our agency's policy to do that. It's also required by um, Medicare to make sure they're safe. So the assessment we do, uh, we do some training on, you know, are they prepared? Do they have an emergency kit? Um, is their home accessible? Uh, do they have resources? Make sure that they have power, electricity, gas for heating, things like that. We go over that um, with them on each 
um, start of care. We have a MetaBridge system that contacts us via phone. If there's an emergency and kind of directs us what to do for our clients and which ones are in high risk areas. So as a comparison for people that maybe are in need of services but don't have them, um, do any of your clients already have any sort of emergency preparedness plans when you walk in the door? Any sort of preparedness level? Most of them don't. They don't. When you're talking about emergency situations, it really comes down to your local network of assistance in the home. And how do you create that in a situation where there's no assistance? So you have same diagnosis, maybe even same age, same physical aspects, but one family that can manage, one family that can't, because the follow through is not there. And those guys, unfortunately, have a higher risk of getting rehospitalized and having more complications. And it's just that part's not good. Um, yeah, so some recommendations for uh, emergency planners, uh, an event of emergency for, especially for people part of hearing, um, I would make sure that texts do go out, um, in the event of emergency, um, because you can't always rely on the news, um, and, uh, getting, like, an application out for uh, letting people know about applications so people can get uh, emergency alerts right on their phone. Um, uh, for example, so uh, I live in Sacramento County and uh, they have an app called uh, Smart 911 and um, that will send out specific emergency alerts um, based in Sacramento County. Um, and uh, the fact that not everyone is hard of hearing knows sign language, um, myself included, I'm still learning. Um, so making sure newscasts, newscasts have live captions as well as sign language interpreters. Um, I did read that during Hurricane Katrina, lots of newscasts did not have interpreters, or when they did, news stations would um, cut them out of the frame. And uh, that is... Uh, Definitely not good. <laughs> including, um, including more folks, bringing them to the table that have these disabilities, bring them to the table when you're writing a plan. These folks, these representatives from the, the facilities need, need to be at the table so that there is a, a greater understanding of what we're facing. And I think that how we become more resilient, how we become more inclusive is um, stop being so reactive and really relying on our planning. We need to have a plan in place long before an emergency happens. So I think we just need to make this world a little bit more accessible for everyone. It's people in the deaf community and people in the hard of hearing. Community.